Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, an old friend and mentor of mine, Colonel Dave Maxwell, uh, U.S. Army Special Forces Colonel retired. Uh, Dave is a senior, fe senior fellow at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. He's a 30-year veteran of the U.S. Army, retiring as a Special Forces Colonel. He served for over 20 years in Asia, primarily in Korea, Japan, and the Philippines. And uh, without reading his entire bio, which would take entirely too long, but you can all find that uh, on the website. Uh, without any further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Dave Maxwell. Thank you, Lumpy, and uh, good evening and uh, afternoon and morning to everyone, wherever you are. It's uh, great to be here, and I appreciate the opportunity uh, to be able to uh, participate in this important uh, conference. Uh, so I really, uh, you know, and I, following Deke, uh, I, you know, he always gives a great presentation, and I hope to be able to complement uh, uh, some of what, much of what he said, and offer some, uh, you know, some of my own views to uh, uh, to supplement uh, to supplement his. Um, I'm going to share my screen here, and I'll put up some slides. So share screen. There it is, and. And there it is, share. All right, so let me put this up here. Okay, um, I, I'm gonna talk about all these things and, uh, and Deke already hit on the proliferation of terms and I, I will get into that even uh, uh, in greater detail. I'm gonna talk about George Kennan uh, because uh, you know, you know we're gonna see what is old is new again. Uh, I think there's a lot of historical precedence for where we are now. Uh, and of course, our hero, uh, William, J. Donovan, the uh, family commander of the Office of Strategic Sur Services, who uh, is really an influence over uh, U.S. special operations. Uh, so I'm going to cover these areas here. Of course, you know, the, uh, the Special Forces motto uh, is to free the oppressed. I really like uh, though to, to really describe it, uh, to help the oppressed free themselves. Uh, you know, mentally and, and you know, from a, we need to have the mindset where we're not doing the freeing we're helping the people to free themselves. And that's really the essence of uh, what Colonel Mark Boyette uh, toy, coined in uh, back in 1990, early 1990s uh, in his war college paper, that really the essence of special forces and soft and, uh, and now the broader military uh, is to be able to work through with and by our friends, partners and allies. And so uh, I'll just start out with that. Um, just quickly to what, what I do, uh, Lumpy mentioned the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. Uh, if you remember anything, we are a nonpartisan uh, think tank, a research uh, institute, uh, and our sole focus is to support U.S. national security and U.S. Uh, foreign policy. Uh, we are, as I said, nonpartisan, uh, but of course, Ambassador Kirkpatrick was a Democrat, Senator Kemp was a Republican, Cliff May, uh, I don't know what he is, but uh, he was the original and he's our current president. Uh, and so, like Lumpy said, I focus on Asia, a lot of emphasis on Korea since I had five tours there. Uh, and, um, and my job is really to uh, provide support, whatever DOD, state, Congress, National Security Council, the media, whatever they ask, uh, uh, I, will, uh, I will do. Lumpy asked me to do this, and uh, it's all part of my job. I also teach a course, uh, and I really try to focus on uh, helping to develop future policymakers who are in graduate school for security studies uh, and to help them understand the value of unconventional warfare, irregular warfare, special operations, and, and of course, to trust our special operators. All right, so, uh, you know, question about how is uh, IW being, being accepted? Uh, you know, I think there's uh, long been a decided lack of interest uh, in, uh, in irregular, unconventional political warfare, but these, this form of warfare is being practiced uh, around the world by those who are interested in them. And of course, you know, Trotsky said, uh, war may not be interested in you, or you may not be interested in the war, but uh, war is interested in you. And then I think irregular warfare is certainly interested in, uh, uh, in the United States. And, uh, and so we need to take a, a serious interest in it. Uh, so let's just start with how some of uh, the uh, revisionist and, uh, and rogue powers uh, look at things. I think you're probably all familiar with the uh, the Chinese three warfare, psychological warfare, legal warfare, media warfare, or public opinion warfare. Uh, I think it's most important to read unrestricted warfare. Uh, and, uh, and of course, I give you my, my assessment, thumbnail assessment of, of uh, China and the Chinese Communist Party 
uh, and its strategy and what it's trying to do around the world. And of course, to me, this is uh, the fundamental basis of competition. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk about you know, the competition among various uh, political systems and, and ideologies. Um, just touch on unrestricted warfare. When I was a student in the National War College uh, back in 2004, 2003 and four, uh, the Minister of Defense from China, a four-star general, came and gave a lecture. And uh, I'm usually not one to ask questions in classes, uh, but um, uh, in, in large lectures, anyways, uh, and uh, which is so nice with these type of lectures, we've got chat functions and everything. But you know, I took a risk and I stood up and I, I asked the Minister of Defense, uh, and I prefaced my comments saying that unrestricted warfare seemed like a very prescient. A uh, book that was written in 1999, uh, kind of foretold, uh, you know, 9/11, uh, and of course it was a reaction to U.S. revolutionary military affairs, success in Desert Storm, uh, and basically a how-to uh, book on defeating a, a great power and uh, you know a, a global power uh, or a major power. Uh, and so I asked him. I said, "Has this book been used to inform Chinese doctrine?" Uh, in thinking and concept development. Uh, and interestingly, he, uh, he walked off the stage when I asked that question, you know, kind of uh, like the big, uh, the big pause there. And he consulted with his handlers on the, on the side and he came back on the stage and he, he looked me right in the eye and he said, uh, don't believe everything you read. That book has been debunked. And uh, so uh, my immediate thought was uh, Shakespeare. He doth protest too much. And, uh, and, from that point on, I've always believed that unrestricted warfare had a significant influence uh, over uh, uh, Chinese uh, strategic thinking and others. You know, I think you can see elements of unrestricted warfare, not only not just because it's a, you know, brilliant book written by two colonels, uh, you know, that uh, you know, has a lot of, uh, uh, you know, interesting and, and important concepts, but because a lot of it is common sense. I mean, it's, you know, and all the things Deke has been talking about, asymmetric warfare, hybrid, uh, there's, you know, it's all wrapped up in unrestricted warfare. So I recommend that. Uh, the Iranians, of course, we're, we don't deal with Iran too much in, uh, in, in Asia, uh, although uh, there's obvious linkages between Iran and North Korea, but I'm not going to go into that. Uh, but their concept, you know, as a rogue power, uh, their Iran Action Network, their IRGC, their Quds Force, uh, they are a really... <laughs> a really capable unconventional warfare uh, force. And uh, so they want to use a light footprint, partner with indigenous forces, uh, you know, create coalitions uh, and, you know, a lot of similarities in concepts there, uh, you know, especially partner with indigenous forces and use unconventional warfare. Um, that you could uh, replace that with, uh, with the United States or, or many of our friends, partners and allies. But the Russians, and, uh, and Deke hit on, on General Gerasimov, uh, which was interesting, you know, when he wrote that article about new generation warfare, nonlinear warfare, uh, you know, the little green men, he was actually, according to uh, Tim Thomas out in, uh, in or Charles Bartell uh, out at Fort Leavenworth, wrote a great, uh, uh, great article uh, analyzing Gerasimov. It was interesting that he was describing actually what he analyzed as the U.S. strengths and capabilities, that we were the ones that were fomenting unrest, the color revolutions, the orange revolution in, in Ukraine, and, uh, uh, and the, the Arab Spring, uh, you know, and of course, Libya and, and things that uh, uh, he really believed that we were deliberately fomenting them uh, to cause instability uh, to drive U.S. intervention in, in conflicts uh, around the world. And so his original idea was to develop this concept uh, to be able to counter what uh, what the U.S. has done. Uh, but I think uh, you know, and I think he's he's his work is brilliant. And just a few things to take away from this, uh, you know, just highlighting uh, it is all about information. It's all about influence. Uh, you know, from direct destruction to direct influence, inner decay of your enemies. Uh, you know, from uh, from total war uh, and uh, that that or two total war that includes, you know, the population and the base, uh, you know, base of support, um, and of course from the physical uh, to the conscious mind, including in cyberspace, of course, which uh, is really really important. 
Um, you know, in essence, uh, the Russian view of the modern of modern warfare is based on the idea that it's psychological, it's influence information, uh, and that's really uh, really the key aspect. And of course, as Americans, we have been traditionally afraid of psychological warfare, psychological operations information operations, influence operations. You know, we had to rename psychological operations to military and military information support operations uh, to try to tone it down because of the negative connotations uh, that some people might think we are conducting uh, propaganda. In fact, we're so afraid of using information and influence. Uh, I was at Leavenworth and, uh, and with some psychological operations officers. And of course, over a beer, they were lamenting uh, how difficult it is to influence our own military and our own government to effectively employ psychological operations. And one of them said, it is easier to get permission to put a hellfire missile on the forehead of a terrorist than it is to get permission to put an idea between his ears. Think about that. We can kill somebody uh, easier than we can try to influence them. Uh, now that may seem a little extreme, uh, and I say that for, you know, hyperbolic purposes here. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think there is a lot of truth to that. And it's something that we really, uh, we really should be thinking about. Now, I like to describe special operations uh, and special operations forces in, in two soft trinities. Um, uh, first, uh, of course, being irregular warfare, which is the main overarching, uh, you know, our topic today, but also, uh, you know, really it is uh, as I'll talk about, and as Deke has already men mentioned, the DOD contribution uh, to uh, competition, to great power competition, uh, and I would say to political warfare. Um, of course, unconventional warfare is the foundation, particularly for special forces, uh, psychological operations, uh, civil affairs, uh, and then support to political warfare. And it's a very nuanced uh, uh, phrase here, is support to political warfare. Uh, the Department of Defense and, and SOF, uh, we don't conduct political warfare. We provide support to it. And I'll define political warfare uh, for those who are unfamiliar. And, uh, uh, but we, we provide support to it. We do that through unconventional warfare, uh, through irregular warfare, uh, and using the second trinity, which I, I believe is the comparative advantage of SOF, uh, which is governance, influence, and support to indigenous forces and populations. Uh, Together, that really encompasses uh, the, the, the essence of special operations, traditional special operations, uh, you know, going back to the OSS uh, and really going back farther, uh, but of course the OSS being our first real special operations and intelligence uh, organization. Now, we also have to continue to sustain those exquisite capabilities that we have for the no-fail national missions of counterterrorism and counterproliferation. I mean, that, that goes without saying. And of course, that's what everybody tends to focus on in terms of uh, US special operations is the counterterrorism, counterproliferation, the high end capabilities we have really uh, developed to a high art form, uh, you know, to be able to capture and kill any, anyone anywhere at the time and place of our choosing. Uh, and and those, those capabilities have to be sustained, but not at the expense of what I call the two soft trinities. All right, so uh, Deke talked about, uh, he gave the traditional uh, slides there, and, and, and I hate to be critical, Deke, but uh, you know, I had been criticizing that slide since it was created back in, in 2007, uh, because Clausewitz really talks about passion, reason, and chance. Uh, and we tend to think about government, and military, you know, and, and government and people, and we, we make that, uh, that, that uh, by, uh, you know, bilateral choice there, you know, in the way that we construct, we construct that. Uh, but really the, uh, you know, his definition of war as a true chameleon was really about hate, enmity, and greed, uh, you know, uh, uh, reason, you know, control, uh, and of course, chance uh, being the, you know, province of war and the military. You know, of course, the people represent passion, the government reason. Um, but Clausewitz also recognized, and what's important from an irregular warfare perspective, uh, is that, you know, he talked about national insurrection, even though that wasn't uh, a, a uh, you know, a large 
uh, uh, focus at the time, although we'd had the American Revolution and the French Revolution. Uh, but the Napoleonic Wars uh, were really state on state. But he, of course, you know, cut his teeth in Spain. And, uh, um, you know, and that's where there was a national ins insurrection. And so he knew and he learned the center of gravity uh, that uh, you really had to attack was, of course, the leader and public opinion. Uh, and so, you know, I emphasize this, that Clausewitz understood the ne necessity for information and influence operations. Uh, but of course, it's Sun Tzu that, uh, that I think is really important and, and something that uh, it, it underlies all of the things that we do within the context of irregular warfare, great power competition. And that's really first to understand our adversary strategy. Uh, and then, of course, what is of supreme importance is to be able to attack the enemy strategy. And, uh, you know, generally, traditionally, that may not be kinetically attack it. Uh, it may, it's best to be attacked by, uh, by information and influence. And, of course, uh, T.E. Lawrence, the great uh, irregular warrior, uh, he said irregular warfare is far more intellectual than the bayonet charge. And uh, um, I know no disrespect to infantrymen who have to conduct a bayonet charge. I was once an infantryman. Uh, but uh, we really have to think about irregular warfare as an intellectual um, uh, concept. And, uh, you know, yes, we have to be able to shoot, move, and communicate. We've got to be able to fight in various forms of, of irregular warfare, counterinsurgency, you know, to counterterrorism, uh, you know, supporting our friends, partners, and allies through foreign internal defense. Uh, but it's far more intellectual than a bayonet charge. And of course, one of the things I'm gonna hit on here, and, and again, Deke started talking about this, you know, about the proliferation of terms. And he just touched on a few. Uh, I'm gonna give you, uh, you know, a little historical background here. Uh, but uh, both the late great Colin Gray uh, and Clausewitz you know, knew that we deal with jargon. Uh, and especially in the American defense community, we love to, to come up with new, new terminology, new names, new uh, uh, pithy sounding concepts. Uh, and you can see those that are scribbled out on the chalkboard by uh, Jeff Hassler uh, when he was trying to, uh, when he wrote his article about defining war, but we have hybrid warfare, conventional warfare, whole of government, you know, second, third, fourth generation warfare, asymmetric warfare, the global way of war, net network centric warfare, compound warfare, you know, and, uh, all the all the different uh, things there. So we love our jargon, uh, but uh, sometimes I think we need to simplify. Now the gray zone has been uh, the, uh, uh, the the term of art in the last few years. Uh, number of uh, great thinkers, you know, from Hal Brands to Mike Mazar to Artulia Archiveria, uh, Frank Hoffman. Uh, you know, a lot of the the great thinkers have written extensively uh, on this. Um, Nate Freire at, uh, at the National War College did an extensive study uh, that, that's really, really important uh, as well. But for me, I would just characterize the gray zone as that spectrum. And you saw this on, on uh, Deke's slide, you know, cooperation, competition, and conflict. Uh, you know, obviously we want to cooperate, uh, but we really have to be able to compete. And of course, I think we can have a more discussion on competition. You know, does that mean winning or losing? Uh, and of course, uh, we want to avoid conflict. We've got to prepare for it. But in my mind, in this gray zone, you know, we see the conditions uh, in the forms of conflict, revolution, resistance, insurgency, terrorism, civil war, uh, and all of our adversaries uh, are executing forms of modern unconventional warfare, as I like to describe it. And, uh, and they have their own unique characteristics. But most importantly, they're seeking to exploit those conditions uh, that exist uh, in civil populations uh, and, and exploit those conditions so that they can achieve their political objectives, their strategic political objectives. You know, what is old is new again, Tim Thomas. Uh, uh, this is a Russian concept of reflexive control. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it really is an existing concept. And we see the Russians use this all the time. But I would argue that the Chinese, the Iranians, uh, even North Koreans, even AQ and ISIS uh, use forms of, uh, of reflective control. And, uh, and, and we should uh, really ask ourselves, you know, if, if it is being employed and how we should not fall victim to it. So my characterization of soft in the gray zone um, is, again, we face competition. Uh, but it's, it's not only among state actors and state non-state actors, which our, our uh, irregular warfare annex uh, uh, describes, 
uh, but also in two competing ideas. And this is where competition uh, really takes place, I think. Uh, and, you know, one is the national interest uh, that we maintain a stable international nation state system uh, that, is, that is really sovereignty based, you know, respect for and protection of sovereignty. Uh, and, you know, we, we want the nation state system to function, a rules based order. Uh, you know, that is a, a central idea uh, to uh, the United States, but also our friends, partners, and allies. The majority of our friends, partners, and allies, like minded democracies, you know, we want the nation state system uh, and the international uh, system to function uh, for our benefit, for all of our benefit. Um, and so, from a soft perspective, we can support. Uh, the protection of sovereignty through foreign internal defense, you know, helping our friends, partners, and allies uh, in their de defense programs, their development programs, uh, so that they can defend themselves and, you know, against the whole litany of uh, lawlessness, subversion, insurgency, terrorism uh, that would threaten their sovereignty. And, and I would add, and that's the traditional definition of of sovereign, of a uh, of FID, of foreign internal defense, I would add malign influence and influence operations, which of course can really be described by subversion, uh, insurgency and, and, and terrorism. Uh, but, you know, in the modern world, we really wanna capture the fact that this malign influence, cyber operations, uh, you know, and that's really all part of it. The second idea that is, is competing is uh, what we believe, you know, Americans believe in the fundamental human right that, that people have the right to seek self-determination of government. Uh, that uh, government uh, is, is by consent of the governed, not imposed on them. Uh, and, and that you know, authoritarian governments uh, conflict with uh, those who, uh, who want to be free uh, and have open societies. And so uh, there is this fundamental human right that is, uh, that is, is you know, we believe, and I believe, uh, that self-determination of government is something all human beings have, have a right to. And of course, from a soft perspective, we can support that through unconventional warfare, uh, where we support a resistance or insurgency uh, and uh, to be able to, uh, to help seek their own self-determination. But of course, respect for and protection of sovereignty and right to self-determination can be two you know, ideas in conflict. And so these competing ideas must be reconciled through statecraft uh, and uh, what I would say uh, political warfare uh, and with support from special warfare in the gray zone. Now, lastly, again, to reemphasize, we always will need that scalpel that's provided by our surgical strike capabilities, our high end forces to capture kill uh, targets whenever uh, necessary to support uh, uh, our US national security. Now, again, is it a new idea? You know. Sam Sarkeesian wrote a great book, the late Sam Sarkeesian, in 1993. Uh, and he describes asymmetric conflicts, protracted conflicts, ambiguous and ambiguous conflicts, and uh, the center of gravity being a, a political social milieu. Uh, and I, I disagree with him that, uh, you know, Clausewitz and Sun Tzu have more in common than they have, uh, uh, than they have in opposition. But, uh, you know, he really described much of what, uh, what we see today you know, back in, in the early 1990s. Uh, so this is not, not new what we're seeing. Of course, you can go back to 1962 uh, and you can look at uh, some of the terms we were using. Uh, of course, we had conventional warfare, we had unconventional or sublimited warfare. Uh, and you look at all the terms, guerrilla warfare, paramilitary operations, psychological warfare, revolution, civil war, limited warfare, combination warfare. Uh, and of course, the spectrum at the top, which I really like, because it's the only one I've seen where total war is on the left and total peace is on the right. Normally we see, you know, peace on the, on the left and the spectrum uh, increases to the right uh, where there is war and total war. So, uh, I, but I, you know, we've been thinking about this stuff for a long time, you know, and of course in, in the John F. Kennedy Special Warfare Center in school at Fort Bragg, this is from 1962, you know, and the admonition was use the right word. And you look at the different uh, terms that we have uh, that, that uh, you know, were in vogue back then, but the same types of, uh, of discussions were, were had back then as, as we're having now about how to describe the phenomena that we see. Uh, and of course, uh, in 1994, when I was at the Command and General Staff College, uh, we were shown this slide, the 100 Names of Lick. And of course, uh, uh, 
hopefully some people remember what Lick is, but it was low intensity conflict. The only place where where uh, low intensity conflict remains today is in Deke's office, uh, the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Special Operations and Low Intensity Conflict. You know, no more do we do we use low intensity conflict. But you look at all of these names uh, and, and terms that were used uh, that to describe many similar phenomena. You know. Utwa is operations other than war, Oops. and Mutwa is military operations other than war. But look at gray area phenomena. Uh, you know, so the gray zone existed back then, uh, and, uh, and and many other many other terms that uh, uh, we've used, discarded, reinvented, uh, and uh, and so you know I like to say we've come to a definition and terminology paralysis, uh, which is why I like to stick to uh, the two soft trinities. Uh, for for uh, for for how to describe uh, uh, particularly soft, but uh, the phenomena we face here. Now uh, you look at the national security strategy, the national defense strategy, and of course, as Deke mentioned, there is the interim national security uh, strategic guidance that was issued. I was happy to see unconventional warfare stated uh, specifically there, uh, but I, I'm also glad to hear Deke said that it was on a mission of of irregular warfare as well. Uh, but uh, but I was glad to see that in there. But, you know, the, the old NSS and the current NDS really posit uh, that we faced revisionist powers and rogue powers. And I, I add revolutionary because both Iran and North Korea are revolutionary powers by definition, by their own description. Uh, they are revolutionary powers, but we describe them as rogue, which, of course, is, uh, is correct. Uh, and so we have these revisionist powers, these rogue powers. And of course, then we have what I like to call the modern nation state powers, which is the US and the rest. Uh, and you know, while the rogue and, and uh, revisionist powers attack the international nation state system uh, to create their own or to take advantage of it for their own uh, purposes, um, you know, we really believe in protecting that system, making it work for all. And we value the, the uh, you know, the, and we, we live for and seek to protect the fundamental values of freedom, individual liberty, liberal democracy, free market economy, rule of law, and human rights. You know, and so that's the U.S. and the rest are, are like-minded. So really what we have is open versus closed societies. Uh, it's an ideological war, but we also see that, you know, we are traditionally Clausewitzian, and, and Clausewitz said that war is politics by other means. Uh, but for our adversaries, for them, it is politics is war by other means. And that may seem like a subtle difference in, uh, in, in wording there, uh, but it really means in my mind that they view this competition as political war. You know, it is war for them. Uh, and uh, and they, they have that mindset. And of course, we view war is after diplomacy, uh, you know, can no longer solve problems. Uh, and, you know, we, we, you know, even though, you know, I, I always hate it when I hear people say that, you know, diplomacy stops when the first bullet's fired. You know, that's not true. Diplomats jobs continue through the entire spectrum of war. Uh, but, uh, you know, we tend to think of it in a binary uh, way that uh, we have diplomacy on one side and it doesn't accomplish our mission. We go to war. Uh, but really, they're, they're of course, uh, always inextricably linked. But for our adversaries, politics is war by other means. Uh, and I think we have to embrace that and understand it. So for me, great power competition really equals political warfare. And this is the most likely uh, condition that we are, are facing and we will face. State on state warfare is less likely for all the reasons Deke talked about. I mean, we are able to conventionally deter uh, nuclear, <laughs> nuclear deterrence uh, works uh, and, and so it's less likely, but it's most dangerous. And so to me, it's not a question of either or, uh, it is really both and. We cannot effectively compete uh, in great power competition and, and in a political warfare environment unless we have a superior military capability uh, that we can fight and win state on state warfare, uh, the most dangerous and the worst case. Uh, but we've gotta be able to operate in the gray zone Political warfare, irregular warfare. Uh, again, it's not either or, it's both and. So what are the major differences and views on warfare? And I think that uh, 
you know, I've, I've already emphasized this, but let me say it this way. The psychological takes precedence and it may or may not involve kinetic operations. Uh, again, politics is war by their means, but for the U.S., we tend to put the kinetic first and the psychological second. Uh, you know, again, for us, war is politics by other means. Uh, Napoleon's famous dictum there, you know, I would argue that for us, uh, the psychological is to the kinetic is 10 into, is to one in the, in the modern era here. Uh, now, we've got to learn to put the psychological first. Uh, can we do that? Can a federal democratic republic do strategy uh, this way? Or, or do the authoritarian states uh, have the advantage? Uh, are they able to do that? Um, there's a link there to a, a proposal for, uh, for an American way of political warfare that I would uh, commend to you. Uh, so the problem is today we face threats from political warfare, uh, if political warfare strategies, and they are supported by hybrid military approaches. Uh, again, Deke laid that out uh, about hybrid conflict. And, uh, uh, you know, and of course, all these terms here uh, really embrace and, and describe uh, the political warfare environment uh, that, we, uh, uh, that we face. Uh, so what is the solution? Well, one way is we have to learn to lead with influence. Uh, I mean, that's really, we've got to, uh, uh, to get to the point where we are comfortable with leading with influence. Uh, we've got to be able to counter our adversaries' political warfare campaigns, uh, but not only counter them, we've got to conduct what I like to say is a superior form of political warfare. Uh, and, and that really uh, takes not only a whole of government, whole of society approach, but it takes an alliance approach. Uh, and I'll talk about that. Uh, so we need some cultural organizational changes. Uh, and I would go back in history and look at uh, some of the lessons from the OSS, which I'll just... Uh, lay out here. Of course, why we were able to have such success uh, in World War II, uh, you know, was that President Roosevelt supported Donovan. Uh, there was no doubt about that. Soft, we have benefited from congressional support, uh, you know, particularly since 1987, uh, 1988, the, uh, or 1987 and the uh, Nunn-Cohen Amendment to the Goldwater Nichols Act in 1986. Uh, of course, uh, OSS had a, a strong partnership with the uh, uh, with the UK, the Special Operations Executive, uh, empowered leadership, small organization, 13,000 total, about 7,500 real operators, uh, you know, that were conducting global operations. Uh, but of course, they faced a lot of bureaucratic in, in, infighting, uh, you know, resistance from MacArthur, Nimitz, you know, from the ch Joint Chiefs and, uh, and theater commands, and, uh, uh, and they, had to, they did have to color outside the lines. Of course, intelligence was a, a huge contribution uh, that the OSS made. And of course, like special operations today, they're dependent on, on intelligence. Um, but the other thing, you know, the OSS, like special forces, grew out of psychological warfare, the Department of Psychological Warfare. Uh, OSS really grew out of morale operations, the, the original uh, Office of War Information. You know, so it started with the idea that we have to influence uh, and then it developed the, the, the rest of the capabilities of the OSS. Uh, and, you know, I would say there's been there, you know, since that time, uh, there hasn't been as much influence uh, or emphasis on influence operations uh, there. And of course, research and analysis, which ended up, of course, uh, becoming the CIA, CIA analytical division, as well as the State Department uh, INR, uh, Intelligence and Research uh, Division. Um, and they had an ability to gather and analyze information uh, that uh, that was, you know, really at the time, uh, the best in the world. All right, so we irregular warfare. Um, Deke touched on, on that, uh, and I, I note here in our new annex, which I am very supportive of and, and I believe in, uh, you know, the new annex, it goes back and it, and it really uh, uh, reaffirms uh, our view on irregular warfare going back to 2007 when the original uh, DOD directive uh, uh, defined it. And of course, we've taken out violent. Uh, and so it's a struggle. Uh, and of course, it consists of unconventional warfare, foreign internal defense, uh, counterterrorism, counterinsurgency, and stability operations. And I would, I would, I want to make a key point about stability operations. We tend to think of them in terms of nation building, uh, and what we've been doing for the last 20 years, but stability operations is a very conventional capability and necessary because stability operations are what 
occur after war takes place. Uh, under the law of land warfare, we have to restore essential services, provide security uh, for the population. Uh, and that is done from a, an entire military perspective. Uh, and, and it's not just confined to an irregular warfare uh, construct. It is something that we have to be able to conduct as part of major theater, major combat operations, state on state warfare. The entire military has to have that ability. Uh, and so those skills for that mission, you know, do have application, obviously, uh, in lesser uh, 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 levels of, uh, of combat operations. Uh, so the annex reaffirmed this. Uh, and I think the way I read the annex, it's really an integral part of great power competition. It's not separate from, uh, it's not a lesser included case. Uh, David Uko argues that it shouldn't be an annex, it should be in the body. You know, and I'm of two minds on this that uh, I think, you know, it, it, in many ways, it should be integrated as part of the overall strategy. Uh, but I also recognize that if it is integrated, it might get buried. And, uh, and in fact, the NDS, if you really look at it, it, it talks about irregular warfare in many subtle ways, uh, without necessarily using the, the, the specific term. Uh, but, you know, we focus on the lethality and, and uh, you know, and readiness and, and the big issues that are in the, in the uh, uh, NDS. Uh, and so uh, I, I'm, I believe that having an annex for irregular warfare, the only annex to the strategy, uh, actually, uh, I think, sends a signal of how important irregular warfare is. Uh, and so it's not been relegated to an annex. It is something that's so important. It's the only one that has an annex. The only annex exists for irregular warfare. So that's the way I, I spin that uh, and disagree with my good friend, David Uko. Uh, and of course, lastly, all the services have to be able to conduct IW. It's not just a soft function. Uh, you know, although soft, of course, is uh, organized, trained, equipped, uh, educated, and, and often optimized to conduct uh, many of the elements of irregular warfare. Now, I like what Congress did, and I, I tip my hat to Congress uh, although this definition uh, for irregular warfare will not pass the doctrine Nazi uh, test, uh, it, it is, uh, I think, a useful way to look at it. You know, we take our policy objectives, our military objectives, we operate through, by, and with both regular forces, irregular forces, uh, and, uh, you know, it's part of competition uh, between state actors and non-state actors short of traditional armed conflict. I like this definition. I think it really is, uh, uh, it gives, I think, some meat to understanding irregular warfare. Uh, but again, uh, this will not uh, pass the, uh, the doctrinal uh, sniff test. Now, back when uh, the, the original DOD uh, directive was being written, uh, uh, I developed a sketch to try to, to look at this relationship uh, in irregular warfare. And of course, it's very complex, but you know, on the left side is unconventional warfare uh, with what is friendly to us is the insurgency resistance. The population is neutral and the nation state is hostile. Uh, you know, on the right, uh, it's reversed. The nation state is our friend, partner, ally. The population, of course, is being contested. Uh, and in the center is the hostile insurgency uh, resistance movement or terrorist organizations. And of course, we have the five disciplines of uh, unconventional warfare, foreign internal defense, counterinsurgency, counterterrorism, and stability operations. I add counter unconventional warfare uh, because you know we have countries like Iran, you know, that are conducting unconventional warfare in places uh, like Iraq, and so we've got to be able to counter that. And countering unconventional warfare is not the same as counterinsurgency. Uh, really, what we're doing is we're countering another entity, a nation state or organization that's conducting their own form of unconventional warfare. And we've got to be able to counter that. Um, when you look at, uh, you know, people say, well, when do you conduct unconventional warfare? Rarely, rarely do we do. I mean, you know, we, we've done it in, in obviously Afghanistan, Northern Iraq, uh, Syria had, uh, has had uh, really important elements of unconventional warfare, but it is not conducted as much as uh, the other four disciplines are. And so, uh, but unconventional warfare is an offensive form uh, of, uh, you know, an offensive, a strategic offensive maneuver. Uh, whereas 
everything else we're doing is reactive. Uh, FID, COIN, counterterrorism, stability operations, you know, it's, it's reactive. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a counter maneuver uh, to what is happening. And of course, but it's a strategic necessity. We've got to be able to do that. Unconventional warfare is a strategic option. Uh, but the other five are strategic necessities. So the bottom line is, I believe irregular warfare is the military contribution to political warfare. And political warfare is a whole of government. It may be, you know, I think it should be a whole of society effort. Uh, and it's, it is a national level effort, you know, all the instruments of power. Uh, that's why the military does not conduct political warfare. It has to be conducted at the, at the national level. Uh, and, we are working towards, you know, what uh, uh, General Jim Dubik has counseled me, an end state, you know, in the traditional strategy of ends, ways, and means, an end state is not a good description. We really are seeking an acceptable, durable political arrangement that will advance our interests, protect our interests, uh, and, and our national security interests around the world. So political warfare, when you really come down to it, it is statecraft. You know, it is, it is statecraft, statesmen at the national level orchestrating all the instruments of power. And of course, some, uh, like one of my many mentors, uh, Lieutenant General uh, Charlie Cleveland, would call it irregular statecraft uh, as a way to look at that. So political warfare. So let's step back in history. 1948, uh, uh, George Kennan, you know, was of course Mr. X, wrote the long telegram. We've just had a longer telegram by some former government official uh, focused on China, but his long telegram was focused on, on the Soviet Union. Uh, and he developed the concept of political warfare, uh, which really carried us through the Cold War. Uh, and if you look at this definition, uh, you know, it is not, uh, you know, it is not soft exclusive. It's not the CIA exclusive. You know, it, it is whole of government and it talks about political alliances, uh, you know, economic measures, um, you know, and of course, the full range of information influence operations and support to resistance movement. So uh, this is really a comprehensive uh, uh, look at, uh, you know, actions and activities and strategies short of war uh, that we want to prevent uh, uh, kinetic confrontation. Interestingly, I would say that when you look at Russia's new generation warfare, you look at the Chinese three warfares, uh, you look at the Iranians, uh, they are all using elements of this. I mean, it's like they, you know, I mean, Imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. And, uh, and so I think that uh, we are seeing others. Uh, and of course, I get criticized all the time and say, you know, political warfare in the United States is dead on arrival. People won't accept it. People won't, uh, uh, the State Department won't accept it. You know, I was countering, well, George Kennan was a diplomat. You know, he was a, a career foreign service officer. Uh, you know, this wasn't developed by the military. Uh, it came out of the State Department. So I think we should consider that. Now, another look at political warfare, uh, Paul Smith in uh, 1989 wrote a great monograph at NDU, and he really focused on the information component of political warfare. And the first line really says it all, the use of political means to compel an opponent to do one's will based on hostile intent. Uh, and I think that's really uh, what, we, uh, what we have to understand. This competition that we are in includes hostile intent by the revisionists and rogue powers. Uh, maybe not directly against the United States, but in many cases, certainly against our friends, partners, and allies. Uh, and that's why like-minded countries, like-minded democracies uh, need to work together to counter that kind of malign influence. That malign influence is based on hostile intent. So the gray zone, uh, and, uh, and I, I recommend uh, the uh, Assessing Revolution and Certain Strategies Project. Uh, the uh, link is there. Uh, Yusuf and Johns Hopkins University has done some tremendous work uh, developing casebooks to modernizing uh, the traditional work done by the old Special Operations Research Office. Uh, but the gray zone, you know, I think all these elements fit into this, uh, into the gray zone. Uh, it, it is where soft does thrive, but not exclusively soft. And of course, all of this can take part, place in the, the uh, uh, conditions of great power competition, the context of great power competition. So what is unconventional warfare? Well, you know, you got what the media thinks it is and the conventional army and the gym, uh, you know, the young guys, but I, I like to think of myself as a, as a practicing, uh, you know, a, a trying academic and I'm definitely an old guy. So I, I think unconventional warfare is really 
It's about, it's a thinking man's thinking person's game. Uh, and it's about working with through by and with our friends, partners and allies, indigenous uh, forces. Uh, so this is the definition. I think everybody's probably familiar with this. I, uh, but it, it, it is not something that special forces, special operations forces decide to do. Uh, it's a national level decision. Uh, and, you know, to decide to support uh, a resistance or insurgency to coerce, disrupt or overthrow a government or occupying power. Uh, and I say an occupying power could be a nation, a, a non-state actor uh, in my, my definition, but that's a national decision. Uh, operating through or with an underground auxiliary or guerrilla force in the night area, uh, that's really the province of uh, special forces, psychological operations, and of course the CIA. Uh, General Mulholland would call this shared battle space, uh, often to uh, uh, to describe that. But to me, unconventional warfare, and, and the reason I I really uh, uh, make this part of the soft trinity is because it is unconventional warfare that really informs everything that soft should be doing. Because fundamentally, it's about problem solving, complex political military problems. Uh, you know, unique, non-doctrinal, non-conventional methods, techniques, people, equipment. It's about solving or assisting in solving complex political military problems. And that's what, of course, irregular warfare, political warfare is all about. Uh, and fundamentally, it's about influencing behavior of those target audiences, uh, which, of course, can be a population, part of the population, some political entity uh, structure or a military force. And so it's integral to the action arms in uh, information operations, psychological operations, civil affairs. Uh, and of course, these are just for historically, traditionally, uh, the uh, unconventional warfare objectives, uh, you know, undermining legitimacy, uh, neutralizing power, shifting power from uh, a corrupt government to a resistance organization, you know, destroying confidence, you know, emphasis on influencing the will of the target audience's leadership. Uh, you know, of course, isolation, you know, uh, obtaining support or neutrality, all of these are traditional objectives of unconventional warfare, often overlooked, rarely discussed. But really, when you look at deeply in unconventional warfare, it undermines and the thinking, uh, the mindset of unconventional warfare uh, really provides a foundation for thinking across the spectrum of uh, irregular warfare and political warfare. So Yusuf Sak wrote a paper uh, uh, to support to political warfare. And again, the, the subtle words there, soft support to political warfare, we don't own it. It's whole of government. Now, soft is well suited, of course, to, uh, to, to lead a DOD contribution to political warfare, uh, but uh, they don't lead it. It's not something that belongs to soft or the Department of Defense. Uh, and because... It's diplomatic, it's economic, you know, and yes, there are security elements and information and influence elements. Now, I, uh, I've written a lot about uh, um, these areas here and uh, the eight points of irregular warfare. I just want to touch on, on uh, really two. Uh, one is assessment uh, and soft contributes to DOD and to the larger interagency through conducting assessments, uh, understanding you know, developing situational understanding, not just situational awareness. Uh, and what's important is we have to understand the indigenous way of war and adapt to it, not forcing the U.S. way of war on indigenous forces, uh, especially if it, you know, it's beyond their capabilities uh, and, and counter to their uh, history and customs and traditions. Uh, the second point, number five, I really want to emphasize is assuring U.S. and indigenous interests are sufficiently aligned. Uh, this is really critical uh, because, you know, we can create a moral hazard uh, by supporting uh, a resistance, uh, an indigenous force uh, for U.S. interest. Uh, but if we leave them hanging, which we have done, sadly, uh, then, then it undermines our, our, uh, our legitimacy. So I just point those out. Uh, for me, uh, special forces, civil affairs, psychological operations should always be uh, observing for the conditions of resistance, wherever they, they operate, regardless of their mission, they should have a thorough understanding of resistance, uh, political resistance, uh, and, and what is happening. And they should report on that uh, and provide uh, an assessment, uh, as well as an expert recommendation. You know, when we observe the nation stages of resistance, we understand the political environment. Should the U.S. support that resistance 
or should it counter that resistance in support of a, a friend, partner, and ally? Uh, and if if either, you know, how do we how do we do that? All right, so I want to just turn to, uh, to to China and their One Belt One Road or Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, you know, a, a geographic portrayal of some of the things that uh, that that China is uh, is doing. Uh, of course, expanding its influence, uh, economic influence, uh, and uh, uh, you know, and, and of course, geographic influence. You know, another way to look at it, you look at all the the different infrastructure, the investments that they're making, uh, which can be good and uh, or can be not so good, depending on uh, if a country falls into the debt trap or uh, you know, and, and experiences uh, the effects of malign influence. You know, for myself, you know, I think we look at what China is doing, is there resistance against their activities in countries? Uh, you know, is there the potential for there to be resistance? Now, not resistance against their own government, but resistance against Chinese malign influence. You know, can that resistance be supported? Can it be exploited? You know, and can there be a campaign to support uh, what the, the, the White House last May uh, provided a new strategic approach to China. We'll see what the Biden administration does, but it seems like uh, they're continuing to focus on obviously promoting American prosperity, advancing American influence, preserving peace through strength. Uh, all of these, uh, I think, are going to be common to the, the next national security strategy and our focus on competition with China. Um, and so I ask, you know, can we support the Global Engagement Center? Uh, you know, from an information influence activities perspective, uh, states global engagement center, you know, to support and exploit resistance against Chinese malign influence. You know, the State Department, it's Blue Dot Network, Economic Prosperity Network. You know, the, the question from a soft uh, viewpoint is, uh, is there a role for the two soft trinities uh, within the context of this competition uh, that is really illustrated uh, by, by China's expansive influence uh, through its Belt and Road or One Belt, One Road uh, uh, initiative. And lastly, I'd just like to touch this, you know, earlier uh, somebody asked about, uh, you know, how we counter uh, social media, unrestricted use of social media, uh, you know, and, the, and the, the attack that we are under, you know, of hostile influence operations. Uh, this quote is from our 2017 National Security Strategy. Uh, I wonder if it will be in, you know, something like it will be in our, uh, our, uh, our, our new national security strategy. Uh, but regardless, this is common sense. You know, a democracy, you know, which I think most everybody on this call uh, probably believes in, in, you know, democratic principles and, you know, for their country, you know, it's only as resilient as its people. You got to be informed, you got to be educated, engaged. Uh, and, you know, you've got to understand, and like Sun Tzu said, understand the enemy strategy and be able to attack their strategy because they are trying to undermine our legitimacy. Uh, and, you know, they're using all of the, uh, uh, the, uh, the media, uh, social media, you know, uh, conventional media. Uh, we've got to be able to, uh, to understand what they're doing and be able to counter that. Uh, and of course, if you believe in our values and, and universal values, our, your country's values, uh, then, uh, uh, you know, nothing should be able to undermine uh, our system of government or that of our friends, partners, and allies. People always ask uh, for readings. Uh, I provide some historical readings. Obviously, some of the great thinkers uh, listed at the top, uh, some of the, the work on resistance and uh, revolution, on uh, uh, understanding uh, culture uh, in, uh, in terms of uh, irregular warfare, and of course, uh, some of the very practical things we should read on restricted warfare. We should read Gene Sharp, you know, Saul Alinsky's Rules for Radicals, great organizing uh, uh, principles also associated with socialism and communism, but really have great application uh, in unconventional warfare. Of course, Mark Boyette uh, coined the term through, with, and by. Uh, and of course, the doctrine that comes out of, uh, of, of the Special Warfare Center and school at Fort Bragg. So to conclude, uh, you know, I subscribe to George Kennan and political warfare being uh, that logical application of Clausewitz and really using all means, all elements of national power at our disposal to be able to accomplish our objectives short of war. You know, and I think the two soft trinities apply. And really, this space between peace and war 
you know, that's hybrid, political, irregular, unconventional, you know, where competition occurs, you know, are we going to be comfortable operating in that area? Are we willing to do strategy in that space? Uh, and, uh, and of course, as practitioners, uh, can we inform and influence our national leadership that we have the will, the ability, the capability to operate in this space uh, and to conduct our own form of modern irregular warfare, modern political warfare as part of great power competition? So with that, I will uh, uh, I've given you the T.E. Lawrence quote, uh, General Downing, the late General Downing said, uh, borrowed from our, our brother in the, the SAS, you know, who dares wins, you know, for him, it was who thinks wins. And, uh, and General Schumacher, Schumacher said, uh, train for certainty and educate for uncertainty. We have an uncertain future. We have to train to shoot, move and communicate, but we also have to uh, educate for uncertainty uh, because not only do we have to outfight our enemies, we have to outthink them. 